In this video, I will break down the five high yield malabsorption syndromes and explain everything that you need to know for COMLEX and USMLE and not anything further. Here are the five disease processes that we'll talk about, celiac disease, pancreatic insufficiency, lactose intolerance, tropical sprue, which is like barely deserves even being mentioned because it's so simple, and Whipple disease. So let's get started with celiac, which tends to be the most important and the most often covered. So pathophysiology here, there's gliadin intolerance, and gliadin is basically a gluten component due to IgA anti-tissue transglutaminase. And this causes a perpetuating cycle of malabsorption. So what you have is in gluten, which essentially in gliadin, which is a derivative of gluten, you have that causing intestinal villi damage. Again, the person is unfortunately intolerant to gluten and that damages the intestinal villi. Once the intestinal villi are damaged, there is an immune reaction. However, the immune reaction causes more intestinal villi damage. So inflammation causes more inflammation. And what this leads to over time is a perpetuating cycle marked by pathological changes, including crypt hyperplasia, intraepithelial lymphocytosis, villus atrophy, and collectively, these increase the risk for something called T-cell lymphoma. So what's happening here is that the person is at, its, at their core intolerant of gluten that damages the intestine, that causes inflammation, that causes more intestinal damage, and over time, elements of the intestine work more poorly. So if you look under a microscope, you see crypt hyperplasia, the villus atrophy, and intraepithelial lymphocytosis. Because the villi are atrophied, you have hyperplasia of the crypts, obviously your intestinal function is going to be decreased. So every time you or the patient eats gluten, you're intolerant of that gliadin and you have this cycle. On your exam, the symptoms are gonna be vague GI symptoms paired with non-GI symptoms. And what's going to be challenging for you is connecting those semi-vague generalized symptoms with these extra intestinal symptoms. So GI wise, every disease in this video today can cause diarrhea, lethargy, GI upset, vomiting, and steatorrhea, right? Malabsorption is going to lead to things that should have been absorbed being pooped out in the diarrhea, and we call that steatorrhea in the case of fats. For celiac specifically, you wanna be on the lookout for mouth ulcers, Derm dermatitis herpetiformis, and I've got a picture of that and a histological description of that in the coming slides. Anemia due to malabsorption of folate, B12, and iron. Coagulopathy due to malabsorption of vitamin K. Neurological symptoms and osteoporosis. So if you're taking your exam and you see any of these black bolded things thrown into a vignette with vague GI symptoms, chances are that the test writer is going to move in the direction of celiac disease and ask you something about perhaps pathophysiology. Maybe they show you an image of dermatitis herpetiformis. Maybe they show you a picture of mouth ulcers and then they ask you for the diagnosis. Under a microscope, some things you wanna be on the lookout for. Usually if the exam writer is going after it in terms of histology, they'll show you crypt hyperplasia. But more often than not, if they're gonna show you an image as it pertains to celiac disease, this is what you're gonna see you're going to see dermatitis herpetiformis. And so how this is classically described is a pruritic rash on the extensor surfaces, so around the elbows, on the forearms. How it's described histologically is that you see subepidermal blistering with neutrophils at the tips of the dermal papillae with perivascular inflammatory cell infiltrates. What's happening here is that the circulating IgA antibodies bind to something called epidermal transglutaminase 3. That TG3 is actually in the epithelium and it binds to those circulating IgA antibodies. That creates an immune reaction in people who have the circulating IgA antibodies in celiac and TG3 in the epithelium, typically on the extensor surfaces. And how that looks clinically is this image that you see here. And it's called herpetiformis because it can be said to look as if it is herpes. Herpetiformis, meaning looking like herpes, but of course it's not HSV, it's a rash that's associated with celiac. So if you see this, the test writer wants you to pick celiac. Now this is associated celiac with HLA-DQ2 and DQ8. 
As I already mentioned, it increases the risk of T-cell lymphoma. And something that's really important to know for step two, level two, and beyond, something that would really impress your attendings when you're on your rotations, is to know that one of the tests that people do to diagnose this is an anti-endomesial IgA antibody test that tends to be positive on exams, at least, in patients with celiac. However, there is a strong association between celiac disease and IgA deficiency. And if somebody has an IgA deficiency, their anti-endomesial antibody will be negative, and it'll be falsely negative because they don't have IgA antibodies. So if they have an IgA deficiency, then the anti-endomesial antibody, which is an IgA antibody, will be negative, not because they don't have celiac, they may actually have celiac if step two level two is testing you on this, but it's just that they have an IgA deficiency. So that's a very high yield clinical tidbit to put in the back of your brain. Celiac is also associated with autoimmune conditions. So if you have in the vignette a family history of autoimmunity or the patient themselves has some past medical history described in the vignette, such as type one diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, etc., that could be an indication that you're dealing with celiac disease if there's vague GI symptoms. Treatment here, because this is intolerance of a component of gluten, it's quite simple, just avoid gluten, and there you go. So that's celiac disease. Derm dermatitis herpetiformis is the big, big giveaway, so know that on your exams. Now let's talk about pancreatic insufficiency. So as the name implies, this is when there is some problem with the pancreas that impairs the pancreas's ability to undergo its endocrine function. And when the pancreas cannot undergo its endocrine function, it cannot secrete the products that are necessary to break down various substances. And that is why this is a malabsorption syndrome. Now on your exam, if you're dealing with an adult patient, the cause of the pancreatic insufficiency is going to be due to chronic pancreatitis. If you are dealing with a pediatric patient, the cause is going to be cystic fibrosis. There are other causes of pancreatic insufficiency, alcoholism, smoking, inflammatory bowel disease, type 1 diabetes, but these tend to be less common. And because they're less common, for the purposes of exams, it's going to be chron chronic pancreatitis or cystic fibrosis. In the case of chronic pancreatitis, what's happening here is that over time, you have repeated inflammatory changes in the pancreatic tissue. So that tissue actually gets replaced via fibrosis over time because you have less functional tissue being replaced in that inflammatory process via fibrosis. You have less of an ability for the pancreas to secrete the enzymes necessary to break substances down, thereby causing malabsorption. In the case of cystic fibrosis, the CFTR mutation affects epithelial cells of the pancreatic ducts in addition, you have decreased ductal bicarbonate secretion, and those two things combine over time tend to lead to a chronic obstructive pancreatitis. So although the etiology for the pediatric patients is that they have cystic fibrosis, over time you can expect that to kind of manifest in obstructive pancreatitis. So one way or the other, whether you're an adult, whether it's a kid, it's going to be obstructive pancreatitis. Now, the symptoms that you're going to see here are fat-soluble vitamin deficiency. So we're talking about vitamins A, D, E, and K. The reason that this happens is that the pancreatic enzymes are required in order for fat-soluble vitamins to be broken down and absorbed in the ileum. And the, the name fat-soluble should be an easy way for you to memorize this. Because they're fat-soluble, obviously, we need pancreatic function in order to properly metabolize and therefore absorb them. In the case of B12, it's actually quite interesting. The exocrine pancreas function is required for the production of intrinsic factors. So when you have pancreatic insufficiency, therefore you cannot adequately produce intrinsic factor, you cannot adequately use vitamin B12. So in order to diagnose and recognize pancreatic insufficiency on USMLE and COMLEX, you probably need to know what it looks like when somebody has a vitamin A deficiency, a vitamin D deficiency, a vitamin E deficiency, a vitamin K deficiency, and a vitamin B12 deficiency. As you can probably tell from just hearing me talk about it, this is a really easy topic where the exam writer can give you a third order question and connect this GI pathology with 
what is considered to be biochemistry and vitamin deficiencies. Obviously, as I touched on in the beginning of this video, all of these malabsorption syndromes are going to cause steatorrhea, weight loss, GI upset, watery diarrhea, etc. So the way that you should think about this is that you have pancreatic insufficiency. ADIC, A-D-E and K, are your fat-soluble vitamins. So please, please, please know these presentations. Last thing for pancreatic insufficiency, you can diagnose this with a fecal elastase 1 test that's going to be low. However, you should know that when somebody's having watery diarrhea or if a patient is post-pancreatic resection, this is not a reliable test. So for USMLE and COMLEX step 1, level 1, low fecal elastase 1 equals pancreatic insufficiency. For step 2, level 2 and beyond, and if you really want to impress your attendings, this test is not reliable if they're having watery diarrhea or if they are post-resection. So that's pancreatic insufficiency. Remember your fat-soluble vitamin deficiency presentations. Lactose intolerance. So as the name implies, this is an intolerance of lactose. Lactose is a disaccharide. Under normal circumstances, it is broken down in the intestinal brush border by the enzyme lactase. ACE is an enzyme that breaks whatever's in front of it down. So it's acing the lact. It breaks down lact. It breaks down lactose. It breaks it down into glucose plus galactose. So in lactose intolerance, most often the cause is due to a deficiency of the lactase enzyme in the intestinal brush border. So if we knock out that enzyme, we're never breaking lactose down. We have increased levels of lactose. And what happens, there's actually two things here. One, as you can see in red, you have bacterial fermentation of that excess lactose into monosaccharide, monosaccharides, excuse me, which decreases stool pH. So if you see decreased stool pH on your exam, they're telling you that the patient probably is lactose intolerant. The other process that's happening here and what you see symptoms wise is that with all that excess lactose, it causes osmotic diarrhea because you have an osmotic shift to all of that lactose. So again, pathophysiology, we've got a lactase enzyme deficiency. What's incredibly important to know on USMLE and COMLEX is that the intestinal mucosa will appear normal in a primary lactose intolerance. And this is really important because when you're taking your exam and you're trying to work through your differential to figure out what GI disease or process am I dealing with in this question, they're going to tell you that the intestinal mucosa is normal if it's lactose intolerance. Because if they don't tell you that, there's no way to differentiate the vague GI symptoms against something like Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, certain malignancies, because again, all of the symptoms of lactose intolerance are pretty vague. So unless they tell you that the intestinal mucosa appears normal, or they give you something that screams lactose intolerance, like patient drinks a glass of milk and has explosive diarrhea and GI upset, you have no way of knowing that. So again, symptoms unsurprisingly, gas, bloating, GI upset, nausea, vomiting, flatulence, it's not going to seal the diagnosis for you, so don't even worry about it. Diagnosis-wise, you can use something called the lactose hydrogen breath test. Not really important to iron into your brain, but just know that this will rise after consuming lactose. So if you see the results of that and they tell you that it goes up, you're dealing with lactose intolerance. Treatment here, similarly to how we treat celiac with avoiding gluten, we treat lactose intolerance with avoiding lactose. So pretty simple. That's lactose intolerance. Tropical sprue is probably the least high yield and least important disease process to know on this list, but let me just run through it in about 30 seconds. So tropical sprue is essentially celiac, but it responds to antibiotics. It affects recent travelers to the tropics, hence its name tropical sprue. It's very prevalent in people who visit Puerto Rico, Haiti, Cuba in the Western Hemisphere. And then on the other side of the globe, it's pretty not pretty common, but relatively more common in India. Symptoms-wise, you're looking at symptoms of celiac, and then more prominently on your exam, the patient will present with a B9 or a B12 deficiency. Again, this responds to antibiotics. The thought process is that there's some infectious, probably infectious etiology causing this and causing those intestinal changes. But on your exam, it's going to look celiac, it's going to resemble celiac, and then they're going to tell you either something that rules out celiac and ask you what the diagnosis is, or they're going to say, patient was vacationing in Haiti. Well, what's the diagnosis? And you're going to be like, oh, tropics, cool. And that's it. So let's not even worry about it. Pretty low yield. That's tropical sprue.
Lastly, we will conclude this video by talking about Whipple disease. So pathophysiology here is Whipple disease is due to an infection with gram-positive Trophorema whippleyi. And I'm probably butchering that pronunciation. This is a gram-positive, PAS-positive, acid-fast negative infection that causes foamy macrophages in the intestinal lamina propria. Foamy macrophages is the buzzword. So if you see foamy, stop what you're doing. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200 select Whipple disease, and you're done. This infection causes impaired type 1 T cell responses, and because it causes foamy macrophages, it alters macrophage function. Highly associated with HLA B27, although, you know, classically on the, for exams, it's a little bit underappreciated in terms of its association. On your exam, you're gonna see the foamy macrophages, so here are two different pictures. I'm a big believer in not getting overwhelmed by histological images. So even if you're like, whoa, whoa, dirty, what am I looking at? Where are the arrows? I understand your concern, but you can appreciate at a minimum that this is not normal, right? There's something off about these pictures. Even if you don't know what you're looking at, even if you're like, this looks like the spaghetti and meatballs I had last night for dinner, this is clearly not normal histology. So this is an image of foamy macrophages. Now, on your exam, the symptoms are going to be, there's going to be two symptoms. It's kind of like celiac in the sense that they'll give you GI symptoms and they'll give you extra intestinal symptoms. The GI symptoms are going to be everything we've talked about in this video. So weight loss, steatorrhea, diarrhea, but the extra intestinal symptoms are going to be how you seal the diagnosis because I doubt they're going to tell you that the patient was infected with the bacteria. They'll probably give you the symptoms and then have you work backwards and ask you what bacteria is causing this. So let's take a look at those symptoms. Musculoskeletal, you're going to look for arthralgias, hyperpigmentation, and peripheral edema and peripheral lymphedema. Cardiac symptoms, you want to look for pericarditis, endocarditis, and an apical systolic murmur. And then lastly, for neurosymptoms, look for ataxia, clonus, and frontal release signs, which is to say evidence that the frontal lobe is abnormal. If you can spot these symptoms paired with vague GI symptoms, you're probably looking at Whipple disease. And just as a little test taking strategy, if you're sitting there in your exam and you're like, you know, you're dealing with a question that has symptoms from various organ systems and you're like, yo, I have no idea what the question is asking me. That is a moment where you want to start to think, okay, what are the diseases where I have symptoms from lots of different organ systems and then work backwards like that? Because sometimes... There's not a lot of options for diseases that present that way. And if your brain can remember that Whipple disease is included in that list, it, you might get that, you know, aha moment on your exam where you're like, whoa, maybe this is Whipple disease. Let me look at this. And then you see it from a different perspective. So on your exam, you know, know the bacteria that causes it, know the foamy macrophages. Again, foamy macrophages is your buzzword. It's your golden ticket to getting this question right. So remember foamy whipped cream, foamy for foamy macrophages, and whipped for whiplei in Trophorema whiplei. But that's it, ladies and gentlemen. That is your five high-yield malabsorption syndromes. I really hope that this video was useful to you. Keep up the excellent work.